Hello everyone and welcome to Biohackers Lab. I'm your host, Gary Kerwin, and on today's episode I have Dr. Jen Unwin. Dr. Unwin is a consultant clinical health psychologist. She has been working in the NHS for over 30 years to help people with chronic illness to live well with their conditions. Dr. Unwin works with her husband, Dr. David Unwin, to support patients in primary care to manage their diabetes by making lasting changes to their sugar consumption to improve their condition and reduce medication. Jen, thanks so much for coming on to the episode today. You're welcome. Thanks for asking. So I first want to just congratulate you and David. Uh, I got to watch the BBC program that you were featured in, and that was a fantastic uh little documentary that made national tv here in the uk um yeah. so yeah i just want to say if anyone hasn't congratulated you i <laughs> thought i thought <laughs> okay. you guys did a great job thank you so many so many people saw it which was lovely so just completely random people come up and say oh i saw you on the telly <laughs> <laughs> i never thought i'd say in my life so yeah <laughs> yeah quite a journey yeah so um no that was that was a great piece for um low carb and the effects yeah. of carbs on us and that's what we're going to be talking about today because i also got to listen to your talk at the public health collaborations uh, london conference earlier this year and mm. you did a, a really good one about sugar and addiction so that's what we're going to be talking about today is if people can figure out am i addicted to sugar um so yeah. We're gonna we're gonna give them the questions and and the answers today. So, um, to begin with, then I'd like to ask you: Is sugar addiction a real thing? Well, there's there's kind of several different answers to that. So, um, personally, for me, yes, and I know a lot of other people who who would say the same. I mean, you were you were there at the presentation. We we asked the questions, and it was so fascinating that in a, a room full of people attending a conference about you know, which was largely around uh, health and low carb. Um, it, it was striking, wasn't it? How many people stood up to how many of the questions, which were basically about substance addiction, but uh, we were asking people to reflect on their experiences of of food and particularly foods that are high in carbohydrates, not not just sugar. Um, so personally, yes, and I know a lot of other people consider they, they kind of. Uh, um, it helps them to understand it in that way that actually they do have an addiction to, to certain kinds of foods. Now, there is some controversy in, in the literature. So that's also partly what I was talking about at the conference. Um, there are quite a few papers now that are, that are, and books that have written about sugar addiction and quite a, quite a bit of research. But there, um, for example, um, the, the, sort of statistical manual which is for helping people to diagnose mental health conditions which helps people to diagnose other addictions um like substance misuse doesn't consider uh it doesn't have a category for, for food addiction um so that's not recognized in the kind of mental health world as a as a real thing if you like in inverted commas, um, and also there are some, there have been some papers arguing that food addiction isn't a real thing, and I, I, I think you saw at the conference that uh, um, I, I don't know the more the more time you spend in this whole world, the more slightly conspiracy theory you get, don't you, about big food and big pharma? So um, I, I was, uh, as I said at the conference, channeling my Zoe Harkham. I don't know if you've had Zoe Harkham on Biohackers. But, I haven't uh, yet, no. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think people know that um, her PhD was all about smashing the myth about saturated fat and, uh, and kind of avoid, avoiding that for health and that the evidence wasn't there for the guidelines coming in right at the beginning. Um, so I kind of drill back into the one, the one paper which seemed to be um, most vociferously saying that sh food addiction and sugar addiction, there wasn't enough evidence for it to be considered a thing. And lo and behold, um, that was sponsored by Rip Health, which people can Google and you can look up uh, Dr. Rip, who, if you also then Google him, um, you can find that there's a bit of controversy around him because the New York Times did a piece a few years ago showing that he had received some kind of enormous sums. I think it was $41,000 uh, a month, I think it was, um, from the f um, Corn Refiners Association. <laughs> so he, he was actually being kind of funded to promote the message that um, refi refined um, uh, corn syrup was, and has spoken at conferences, that that's kind of an okay thing. And I think most of us know now that 
or mo- most of us in this community would kind of think that maybe that's not <laughs> maybe that's not an unbiased view. I'm trying to be I'm trying to be fair here. So the one the one paper that thinks that food addiction there isn't enough evidence to be a thing seems to be a paper that was um, perhaps there was a kind of um, conflict of interest. A slight, a, a slight conflict yeah. of interest. So, I think there's that personal experience. I think that obviously the way that people s- struggle to give up sugar, I think it is becoming more recognised. And as I say, there's a, as I think there's a growing community of people who recognise that for themselves. And I think those people tend to gravitate towards low carb because it, it it's a way of man. It's a, yeah, we have to eat, don't we? We don't have to smoke, so we can give up smoking. We can give up drinking, which some of us have. Uh, we can give up caffeine and other things, substances that we know are addictive. You can't give up food completely, um, but going low carb or other other kind of um, uh, kind of examples of low carb eating. Um, I was just listening yesterday to your podcast with uh, the lady who went completely carnivore and completely cured all her rheumatoids. Oh, uh, Michaela Peterson. Michaela, it was that was amazing. Um, so. Yeah, people find their own way, don't they? But it, it, it seems to be that that what one way of um, dealing with sugar addiction is to adopt a low carb lifestyle, and I think possibly that's why at the conference, because a lot of people there are, are very health conscious, a lot of them are low carb. You know, maybe people gravitate towards that because they know they have a struggle at the end of the day and they can't maintain their health if they if they have sugar and, and refined carbs. And that's, I think, what I. I got um, a little also quite interested in when you mentioned that that the what what is the official it's called the DSM or something isn't it in clinical yeah so the the there's there's been a whole series of them and it's a, it's it's um it's a way of categorizing mental health um or, or mental or mental illness I suppose you you'd say I mean I try not to kind of I'm a psychologist. I'm not a big fan of. I'm really not a fan. I don't ever la- label people or try and categorise people or diagnose people because I think there's all kinds of problems with that. Not not just for the person, but also in terms of the validity of doing that. We're all, everybody's so unique, aren't they? You see that in health that you know what works for one person do- doesn't work for another. So mm. a DSM is around diagnosing people for research purposes, but also for medication purposes for psychiatric medication. Um, so obviously as a, as a psychologist, that's not, not how I would, uh, tend to think or, or, or want to think. Um, yeah. And this is the, the book that, as you said, psychiatrists would use, um, when they're yeah. looking for medications and psychiatric labels, but yeah. that, that book doesn't, um, recognize food addiction as a addictive, as a condition, does it? That's what you basically... That, the, the latest version of it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. and that's amazing because I, yeah, I would say that yeah. Uh, yeah, we are addicted to certain food groups in a way. Or, I guess my yeah. my next question is 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 an addiction the same thing as a craving? So if I crave certain food types or food groups, is that the same uh, terminology, or is that it, does that fall under addiction? I, uh, obviously, cra- cravings are one one of the many. Uh, things that might indicate an addiction but you might have cravings and that's that's the end of it kind of thing it it doesn't um you'd need a a few a a few other a few other um symptoms or or criteria to kind of say that it was a a proper addiction really okay and i think that moves us into how to test so this is what was really cool uh, that you did with your lecture that you you gave the questions and then people were able to easily answer and then score themselves so if we could yeah. would you mind uh, running us through the questions that people can listening to the show can actually start answering today and and try to figure out do they have an addiction yeah of course yeah so uh there's a there's a series of questions that we went through and we got people to stand up if they thought it applied to them so what we're thinking about here is think think about sugars that um are high uh, foods that are high in sugar or starchy carbs and may or may not be confined uh, combined with high fats as well so the foods that that um tend to be most addictive are those things like donuts or Doritos or things where there's a combination of, of 
kind of carbs, but it, it, the carb is the kind of essential thing. And it's not just sugar, as we all know, uh, starch digests down quite quickly, um, as, as you saw in the Truth About Carbs program, quite quickly into sugar in the body. And so the body doesn't know, doesn't know the difference whether you've had rice or um, potatoes. Yeah. Yeah, potatoes or cake or, you know, just a whole, like, you know, four teaspoons of sugar to the body. It's all, it, it, you know, it's all the same, really. So the first one would be taking the substance. So in this case, we're, we're talking about those kinds of foods in larger amounts or for longer than intended. And um, I think at the conference, we all kind of give, we ask people to give some examples, don't they? Didn't we? Those people that, that stood up. So it, it's where you kind of say to yourself, well, I'll, um, I'll, I'll just have one slice of cake. <laughs> and uh, quite, quite a lot of us understand that, you know, that that's actually never going to happen. We're sort of kidding ourselves slightly and we'll kind of go back. My dad used to do a thing where he used to level off the cake, but leveling off the cake in these kind of tiny slices always added up to about half a cake by the time it finished. So taking the substances. So keep account, everyone, of, of how many of these you would. So that's I question think, number one. Question number one. And the other thing is that at the conference, obviously, a lot of people were low carb. So they, they, this perhaps didn't apply to them anymore or they, they'd given up these kinds of foods. So we're asking people to reflect on when they weren't. So that may be true for some of your audience as well. This may be kind of historic thing that they struggled with. OK, so the, the second one is wanting to cut down uh, or quit, um, but not being able to. So exactly like smoking, knowing it's bad for you, kind of thinking, oh, gosh, you know, this... This is this is getting a bit out of hand. Thinking that logically, um, but actually, almost. Uh, I mean, I, I was saying at the conference as well, because of course this has been interesting for me. Actually, almost seeing your hand reach for the biscuit barrel and thinking, "What?" Your, your conscious part of your brain, the, the sort of logical frontal bit, is thinking, "Why? Why am I doing that?" But it's, it's kind of almost dry. There's almost like a sort of it's almost like being taken over in a weird way, isn't it? when you can't you can't resist that urge so wanting to cut down or quit but but not being able to is number two mm -hmm. and the and for anyone listening these are all sort of like yes no questions yeah yeah, yeah. i think if people have, have, have struggled with that i mean i suppose you i suppose some people are struggling more with that aren't they but i i, I think you know if it's an issue for mm. yourself so um so the next one is spending a lot of time obtaining the substance and what was interesting because obviously you can see how that would apply to drug addiction where people might have to go out of their way to try and find a source of the the drug like, that they're craving walk, walk, walk the streets or travel a long walk way just to get it i find a guy in a you know who happens to supply whatever it is so i wasn't sure this was going to apply to a lot of people but what what was so interesting in this conference is a lot of people did stand up and told some really personal stories which i'm grateful that people shared and there was one lady wasn't there who said you know, she'd come off a nursing shift in the middle of the night and if someone had mentioned chips, you know, she'd just have this idea that she had to have chips and she'd be driving around the Midlands for an extra hour after the end of a night shift to try and find chips. And it makes no sense, does it? Logically, you could go home and, you know, go to bed or have something else. But no, she she was sort of, and, uh, and other people talked about that as well, you know, like um, kind of try to find their favourite whatever their <laughs> particular thing was so spending a lot of time uh obtaining substance yeah so that, yeah, and and another example is it the one where say you you're thinking of a chocolate bar and suddenly you go i've just got to get it and you jump in the car yeah. and you drive to a, a garage or you know a yeah. petrol station just, and you think i've had to drive all that way just to go pick yeah. up a chocolate bar it's madness isn't it yeah caramel Caramac was one of my weaknesses. I used to love that stuff. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you don't get it everywhere, so you'd have to make a special effort. Yeah, so that 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 yeah, that does apply to people, I think. Okay. Okay. So what are we on? Uh, number four, I think, um, a craving, which is what you mentioned, or a strong desire for the substance. Yeah. So those two things are a bit linked, aren't they? So as you say, you suddenly you suddenly get this craving, and it's almost like it's an irresistible urge, and you can't really focus on other things. You have to go and get that get that get that thing that you want get that fix get the fix yeah absolutely absolutely and that's that, you'll see that comes up as another one of the questions um right this next one is another one i i didn't think might apply to many people but a few people did stand up so uh, unable to carry out obligations at work school or home as you as you might desire 
though some people talked about, didn't they, being kind of too tired to do stuff or, you know, not, not functioning well because they'd actually overeaten to such an extent that it was just kind of lying around. You know, some, some people struggle with this to such an extent that they actually do almost make, them, they make themselves ill, don't they, and they're sort of um, lying around, you know, feeling pretty, pretty bad. So, um, And now would, would a such, with that question too, would it also be that if you become so fixated on trying to get the substance that you're actually not able to do your job properly because you're more concentrated on figuring out how you're going to get this food source versus actually being able to focus on your work. And when's, when's lunch or, you know, you, you, you're craving stuff. Yeah. So there's, um, the, there's, there's some evidence that, that that's the case that you're almost your, you, your cognitive focus becomes very focused on the substance. So that's the same in drugs and alcohol, obviously that people are thinking about how they're going to get it yeah. and focusing on that. Uh, and also there's there's some evidence isn't there around sugar i know david was telling me about this sugar um insulin triglyceride high levels of triglycerides passing into the brain so that you you know you just don't function as well really you just just focused on the next the next fix yeah mm -hmm. so that's the next one um question okay. number six Question number six is continued use despite persistent social or interpersonal problems linked to the substance. And again, I wasn't sure how many people would kind of identify that, but people were saying, you know, that obviously, and I know, um, you know, in a in a kind of minor way, when I used to get in and out of these cycles of, you know, giving giving up sugary things and then kind of kind of relapsing, if you like. Um, it's upsetting for, for partners to see you see you do that and put on weight and lose weight and put on weight and lose weight and it, it is a little bit self harming really and and you know it yourself and the, and those around you can see you doing it and yet you really struggle to you know people really it, it, it's really difficult to get get out of that so um, yeah so continue just despite knowing that it interferes with your social life or causes problems in the relationship, which um, and I, I guess, I mean, I don't pers personally have type 2 diabetes, but I, I guess if you did and your family saw you doing that, that, that would be upsetting for them, wouldn't it? So. And would it even, I'm just thinking of, a, of, of another example where you could have a partner who gets upset thinking, why did you go uh, waste money on chocolate bars again? Like we've had this discussion that you, you're buying too many, I feel, or, you know, um, you're buying you're, you're wasting money because it's so expensive to buy it this way versus that way and you know and you're but yet you've gone and done it again would that be another example mm -hmm. i guess i guess it's hard for people to understand isn't it who 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 aren't addicted to any substance the how the addicted person kind of struggles and it, and is driven and 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 just it, it's going to upset family members and, and yet in a way it doesn't help it doesn't help you you stop doing it really so hmm. yeah yeah i can see how that, that and people did people did identify with that didn't they and i as i say even in a minor way i can i can see that 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 was a, a thing that happened to us but yeah. as you said i think particularly with the diet once you have a condition like diabetes and your loved ones mm. know about it and they've been and they may have gone with you to the doctor and they said you know don't eat the biscuits or blah 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 and then you go home and then they ask for a biscuit with a cup of tea and you're like but I don't want to give you the biscuit. And why are you asking for me? We both know it's not good. And the doctor said, don't do it or whatever. And so that's another example of like, why are you doing it? You're upsetting me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They all people are having to kind of become secret. You know, secret eating is is another kind of feature really is is where, where people know that and they know it's illogical. So they kind of do it. They, they, they sneak off to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Eat it in the car on the way back from the garage. And, yeah, yeah. You know, that, thing and you you know there's wrappers everywhere and any anyone listening who's who's struggled with this will will know <laughs> know this you know these and it, it, it's you know it's very difficult mm -hmm. yeah so question number seven okay, the next one um it's a little bit related really so stopping or reducing important social occupational or recreational activities due to substance use so you know perhaps missing out on um going to events or um you know, going out, eating with work colleagues, or I don't know what I don't know what it might be, but kind of avoiding those situations really. So, um, 
uh, it's a bit related to those other previous ones, isn't it? Where you, you, you that it's that issue of um, because of how sugar works on the brain, it in the reward centres you're tending to just focus on on getting that that reward, and it crowds out all the other things that might be rewarding in life. And that that I think that's one of the things that we can talk about later, which is about how you know how do, it's, a, it's a lifelong like any addiction then it becomes how do you get over it and and that that's a kind of lifelong issue really if you, if you if you have this problem um and that's one thing to consider is is how you how you how you get a buzz in other ways how you how you get happy substance uh, in other parts of your life yeah and i'm thinking even another example there would be if someone is really late for a social events because they had to swing past a drive through takeaway place to get a fix of some sort. And you're kind of like, couldn't you wait? You know, you had to get your fix before the social event or, you know, we're always late for, for friends meetups and that just because you've got to go through the drive through or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Uh, are there, are there any other questions after seven? How many are there again? Uh, yeah. So there's, <laughs> again, this one, doesn't apply so much but uh, use of the substance in hazardous situations mm-hmm. so uh, uh you can see how that would apply to kind of um drugs of misuse can't you and, and alcohol perhaps less likely but people were fessing up to unwrapping that chocolate bar as they were driving along and that must be just as dangerous as using a mobile phone yeah. as you're driving. so eating as you're driving in the car um you know, et cetera. So there were, again, kind of illogical stuff that probably your grown-up brain would know wasn't a right thing to do, but you kind of feel driven to do. Yeah, I can. Um, I, I mean, I, I can relate to that. Sometimes we have, you've again, I'll use the garage just because uh, driving hmm. is so common with everyone and they pick um, convenience food. Yeah, and so, you've, <laughs> yeah, you've just bought the bag, you put it on the, on the passenger seat, but you somehow decide, no, I need to get going. I start driving, but I'm going to try to figure out how to look to the, you know, look to the side, pick it up with one hand, <laughs> unwrap it somehow whilst driving. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, that's but, not very good. You, it's not good, is it? No. no. And, uh, I mean, a lot of people are guilty of that, probably even if they aren't, you know, <laughs> full blown sugar addicts, I would say. Yeah. 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 So the next one is consistent use of the substance despite acknowledging with your logical brain, the persistent physical and psychological difficulties arising from use. So so it's knowing logically that you're upsetting people, you're making yourself more depressed. If you've got diabetes, you're worsening it. You know, if you haven't, well, it's, you know, it's still not great. And perhaps, I mean, for me personally, the the main issue for me was around uh, weight management. You know, I, I didn't, like to be be overweight I was always trying to maintain my weight at a good healthy weight and just struggle with that for years so uh, obviously this kind of um overeating of sugar was a, was a major contributor to that so um yeah so keep keep using it despite mm-hmm. uh the next one is and this is a really interesting one one that pe- people really recognize i think a need for increased amounts of the substance to get the same desired effect so we all know that's a feature of um, drug addiction, smoking, caffeine even, isn't it? Um, alcohol yeah. use. That what tends to happen over time is that we drift into having more and more cups of coffee to keep awake or um, glasses of red wine to calm down after work. And that there is that kind of drift, which you know most of us have to manage with any with anything. But there seems to be this proportion of people who struggle with maybe it's the alcohol, maybe it's some other substance, and and, and, and obviously those of us who struggle with sugar. Yeah, I can imagine um, it, this. More and more. Yeah, and another case would be say you were okay with just having one biscuit, but then suddenly it's like that's not enough. You needed two, three, four. Next thing you're finishing the packet just nah. to get the same feeling of satisfaction. Yeah, the same buzz, and that you know this kind of um, this kind of brain chemistry reasons for that um, that we you kind of down regulate your dopamine, which is the kind of happy is a happy substance, isn't it? But you down regulate those receptors because obviously your brain's being kind of flooded with this stuff, so it tries to rebalance itself by dampening down the response. So you respond by 
trying to ha- ha- trying to more and more to get the same the same buzz if you mm. like. So yeah, two slices of cake, to, yeah, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. We all know how it goes. Um, the, Question the, number the, eleven is cravings and other physical symptoms of withdrawal if the substance isn't available. And this is something that obviously people experience, isn't it, when they go low carb or or, or keto? That you know they do get a lot of uh, cravings in the beginning, and some people when they try and give up sugar that that you know the, the cravings are you know they'll tell you won't they how how powerful those are and that if you if you then have some that that takes away the kind of craving shaky feeling that, that people get so symptoms are relieved by consumption mm-hmm. of the substance. and i think i mean that's something that that people will really recognize even if they're probably not sugar addicts that that um, there is such a thing as you mentioned before as a sugar fix. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, yeah. So those are they. So that's they. eleven questions in total. Uh, let me just check: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. So, and uh, so it now, if someone's gone through that and they've done the yes and no's. Mm-hmm. What's the score now? So what's the scoring system? Okay, so two or more of those would get you all mild, just, you know, kind of mildly uh, uh, mildly addicted. But obviously anything more than that is going to be maybe this is a slight issue for you. And if you, if you, were, if you were ticking off, which in, back in the day I would have ticked off quite a few of those myself and, you know, would, would have shown me that I, I did have a bit of an issue with that. Okay. Mm. So yeah. So you said two if two or less is is okay, but if you're more than two, so if you're like three, four, five, then yeah, you, you look, you know, there's there is an issue there. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm sure a lot of people are going, oh my. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So you know, this, uh, I'm trying to think. His, it, it, I'll have to ask David who it was who who, who wrote one of the chapters in. Diabetes Unpacked, which is Zoe Williams, uh, Zoe Harkham's book on diabetes, who basically says, well, you know, so many of us, uh, uh, we're all, well, he sort of says, we're all, we're all sugar addicts this, in this day and age because we eat so, so many carbs and, and sugars just naturally in that, in the, in this sort of typical diet. People haven't realized how, how much of that is sugar based because they don't understand that starch is sugar, fruit is sugar. Yeah, Except sugars added to processed foods, sugars in all these kind of takeaway foods. It's just the normality that we snack, and what do we snack on? Belvita breakfast biscuits, mm-hmm. um, crisps, even crisps, crisps are a big one. Uh, bananas. Everyone goes, oh, I'm healthy. I'm having a banana. David's pet hates, as you heard, you're at the conference because there's like, is it six or eight teaspoons of sugar in a banana or something? Pet hate that people think that bananas are a healthy snack. <laughs> Particularly if you've got type two diabetes, so um, I think we've we've just norm the, the the food environment. Like say the garage, you go to the garage, it's everywhere. You have to run the gamut. I love to use friendly Whittingstall's attack on W H Smiths for their kind of you know sugar pushing at the tills. It, it, the food environment is extremely sugary, mm. um, and that's sort of become norm. We've forgotten that when we were kids. When I was a kid, anyway, that that you just didn't. It was a special treat to have my Caramac bar. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Instead of waiting to pay your your bill at the uh, at the grocery store in the till, and there's mm. just all these cheap um, snacks that they make mm-hmm. you stand by whilst you're waiting. Uh, yeah. Uh, the food advertising, all about you know, treat yourself, just treat yourself, office cake. It's all we're all encouraging each other to think it's okay and you know that it's it's a big part of why is everybody again so as david said in in his talk so he he's worked in in southport in the same practice now for about 25 years i think 20 25 years and when he first joined i think they had 59 patients with type 2 diabetes most of which were in the 50s or older and let me just ask him, David, how many type 2 diabetics now? Um, over 600. Over 600, a lot of them are young. So that is like a massive, huge increase. Like, 
the genetics of his Southport population haven't changed in less than a generation. Mm. What what's changed is is the food environment, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, once you see it, it's as I mean, you'll be the same. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. And I think that's what makes those of us who 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 talk about it do it ourselves and believe in it so so passionate about about the topic because you, you it, it's like the emperor's new clothes, isn't it? When, once you've seen the issue, you, you can't help just trying to do what you can. Mm. to help people from kind of walking <laughs> walking into into trouble uh yeah mm. so what are your suggestions then if someone's come back that of course as you said um probably most people would actually qualify as addicted because yeah. as you said zoe in zoe's uh, findings yeah most of us crave carbs of some sort but yeah. If if I fall into that category, what would some of your um, suggestions be? Things I can do now to sort of fix that situation. Yeah, so I think everybody's unique, aren't they? That's that's uh -huh. that's the thing to say. So um, people have to work out what's best for them and what their own personal goals are. So if if they've got type two diabetes, that's one issue. You know, there might be some type 1 diabetics listening. There might be people who just want to lose weight. There might just be people who want to feel better mentally because uh, we didn't go into it. But there's there's lots of really negative effects of a high sugar diet on, on, the, on you know, Brain mental health. health. Yeah. Brain. yeah. So um, what are people's personal circumstances and goals? And then there's there's two ways to go i think really essentially aren't there that you've got two choices one is um if if you're not catastrophically addicted <laughs> if you've got to or you're kind of mild, mildly thinking this might be good for my health to kind of cut down some people can do a cutting down process so david was able to do this when i started doing it he i went cold turkey which we're talking about in a minute he he cut things down. So instead of having biscuits at work, because he used to cope with a stressful day at work by having the biscuits in the drawer and having one in between each patient as a little kind of mental boost. And then he went on to men's oat biscuits, I think. So he kind of, and then he went on to almonds. And now he doesn't smack at work at all. He doesn't, he doesn't feel the need to at all. So he, he did a sort of process wide thing. And if people are doing that, they, they can start with the, the kind of pure, pure sugar so if you're adding sugar to tea or you know start with the start with the white stuff and, and cut that out and then try and cut out the things with sugar in like the biscuits or cake people might want to make substitutions um and then depending on how they're coping with that feeling with that what the health goals are what whether it's around weight or blood sugars or whatever it is or just feeling more lively then they might go on and cut out some of the carby foods out of their meals or they might again make swaps for things that are slightly less carby um, and there's loads of information out there isn't there um I mean, you guys know there's diabetes.co.uk they have their low carb program there's dietdoctor.com um they've got information and they um the public health collaboration which was the conference we were both at have david's infographics which have translated common foods into teaspoons of sugar equivalent so if i if i eat this bowl of cornflakes what is that the equivalent to in teaspoons of table sugar and it's just an easy way for people to understand that information so you might just want to slowly cut things down cut things out so that's that's one way to go now uh, so just to recap on that one yeah. sorry jen it's i'm um, so what i'm i'm hearing there is in one way it's the weaning process but you can sort of still stay in the habit of like uh, as you said, David, you're still sitting at the desk, still got the drawer. It's just what you decide to put in the drawer and you can then slowly adapt yourself and realize, oh, yeah, I, I find I keep wanting to open that drawer to deal with the yeah. stress. So I keep reaching for it. But what I can try to do is instead of having the sugary biscuits, I'll try to put some nuts instead and see if – so my hand's still doing the physical movement, but yeah. what I'm putting in my mouth has changed. That's one way of weaning yourself. Yeah, because habits are so powerful, aren't they? I mean, that's yeah. part of we all struggle um uh, these things are very very habit forming of course the other is to think about you know what what are you are you preparing stuff for take to work so you don't end up going to the garage for the ghastly yeah. meal, meal ghastly floppy sandwich crisps and 
muffin or whatever it is for one ninety nine. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I'm thinking um, of truck drivers too. You can imagine people who yeah. work who have to live on the road because of their job, and so the habit is they always have to go through the the payment on, on at the till but it's just mm-hmm. deciding okay so i've I'm, I'm here i'm i'm it's the same situation but i'm just going to decide to try this instead of that pecan nuts or you know um pork scratchings or something you know <laughs> yeah. right, you know, maybe yeah. maybe think about alternatives yeah yeah okay yeah. all right yeah. that's cool so that's the the weaning process that's the weaning process now, now we're um, going cold turkey yeah cold turkey because um uh, as David says, you wouldn't you wouldn't tell an alcoholic just to have one whiskey, would you? So because I love the quote that um, uh, one one sip is 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 no, uh, it's um, one sip is too one one is too many, and a thousand is never enough, and that that encapsulates it for me. So you kind of know you're a sugar sugar addict if if. If um if if one one chocolate bar is too many and a thousand is never enough, so um yeah so because you if we if if we're thinking if we're using the model of an addiction which as I say although I'm not for labelling people it has re it has really helped me to sort of crystallise what what the issues are and in some ways how to help people who are really struggling with it because if you think of it like a proper addiction then you it's clear that you don't tell smokers to just have one cigarette. That's always the beginning of them having a, a massive relapse and then struggling to give up again because that, that's the issue. And you wouldn't tell a, a proper person struggling with uh, an addiction to alcohol to have one drink. It, it just makes no sense. So if you if you get that, then cold turkey might be the way. Because um, any addict will struggle with moderation. That's the problem, isn't it? You struggle with moderation. Otherwise, you would have already been doing moderation. You'd have already been only having one biscuit, not having the entire packet. So because uh, that's the issue, then some people would choose to go cold turkey. And uh, I was amongst those. And then obviously, obviously, you know, that has to be done with with care and thought. Um, uh, So I'm not you know telling people to jump into that but you know if they think that might be uh the way they need to go to to research it think about it carefully get some support if you're on medication make sure that you know you're going to do it safely Mm -hmm. so what was your what was your experience then going cold turkey oh god yeah i felt really bad (laughs) for about a week um so how to defer it's, it is just this thing that people say about the kind of low carb flu isn't it yeah so it's kind of like kind of groaning a lot feeling bad not particularly craving things i don't think but just did feel re- really graham headaches mm, low energy mm-hmm. i don't i don't know if you've ever done this yourself gary and then after about and people often describe this don't they after about seven or eight days you, you kind of wake up it's like you've got through that phase of it and you wake up and you feel incredibly awake, alive, uh, energetic, um, kind of fabulous, really. So, yeah, but it, it's getting through that. And there are ways that, um, I mean, if people look online, there's, 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 there's things to help, aren't they? Like things I know now that might have helped me then. So, um, sugar obviously raises insulin, doesn't it? This is David's explaining all this to me. Insulin, um, helps you um, retain sodium and sodium helps you retain water so one thing that happens is that you we all know this don't we when we go on a diet you lose a lot of water weight initially um, and the headaches are often to do with losing the water and the, and the sodium initially so I think if I'd known some of that at the time I would have been having more salts and you know fluids and that probably would have helped a little bit with the headaches um, yeah so and then you know you fall off the wagon don't you people that's part of part of the struggle so mm, the time. journey part of the journey and you learn and what happens is that you just learn you feel and a lot of people said this i think at the conference you just eventually learn that you feel better mm. so that's the that's the thing that keeps you getting back back on the wagon if you like uh, and i'm so i hardly ever do that now people are always amazed but i just don't i don't eat cake i don't eat carbs hardly mm. Uh, mm. 
Yeah, no, I, I think f- as a f- from my side, I, I can relate in one way. Years ago, I would just a sort of that stress response, that pick me up feeling would actually mm-hmm. get a Red Bull, you know, like a sugar energy drink. And you kind of uh, think I'm combining caffeine with loads of sugar and yeah. and the way it was marketed is like oh no you know have one two three cans in a day it's good as little pick-me-ups and yeah. and then you just see these cans get bigger 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 it's like nearly half a liter to a liter cans now it's something ridiculous and you're like oh my god and, oh. You, and uh, the classic is um when i i've seen people get like an energy drink plus uh tr- like a triple espresso at the same time at, at a petrol station and like holy moly oh. like oh. how how are you trying to keep awake <laughs> and there's an issue there you know and that would be that scenario that you said when you're cold turkey and you're like oh i feel so low energy if i just had a little bit of it, i'll feel completely better again i know that's going to sort me out <laughs> and you're like yeah it may make you feel better but it's that's also the reason that you're in the situation mm. it's yeah. just prolonging it and and also then that once you've crossed that line, then you have oh, just a little bit more. Just a yeah, yeah. Bit. And then you end up back at that same situation of, oh, I need the energy drink plus a triple espresso just to get through this now. Yeah. I, I think the thing is with 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 this, the issue we're talking about, you can't, because you can't avoid food is a bit complicated. Um, and that's what the barrier, I went to a, a conference a long time ago about bariatric surgery and how that can help people with this type 2 diabetes and so on and they were saying well people have to eat you know so there's there's no other solution than than that so surgery is simple people do have to eat yes but you can kind of choose in a way the carbs are the one non-essential food group aren't they i know uh, you, i know this isn't you know i know i understand that this isn't common this isn't the sort of guidelines if you like but but we, we do need protein we do we do need essential fats um we do make our own we do make enough of our own glucose out of our livers don't we that was such a revelation to me that 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 we actually make sugar in the body and enough to kind of keep the brain going so that was, uh, yeah that was that was a really good thing to learn because of course we've been educated haven't we that you need carbs that's the thing that people always say to me when i say well i don't eat that stuff. oh you need to eat that stuff <laughs> And as you said earlier, you're going to get ill. Yeah, and and the moderation thing. I feel better than ever. So yeah, yeah, and I think as you said, uh, a lot of people go, "Oh no, just you know, have some of those treats in moderation." But as you said, if you're in that, if you're in that place where your psychology and your brain health is in this more addictive state, that moderation is just not going to work. You just you're 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 fueling the the cycle and and keeping prolonged agony on the situation. can do moderation you know hooray lucky you <laughs> if you can have, I, I know lots of people who can do it they can have a piece of birthday cake and that's the end of it that's the you know hooray uh isn't that nice but i personally i can't and i think if you know that's the thing to recognize if if actually personally you you, you can't do that it is possible to make to make these changes and to feel you know kind of really well yeah it's interesting isn't it mm. so You've shared a lot of good information there. We we know what sugar addiction is and cravings. We've gone through the 11 questions and we have now know the two main routes that someone should consider. Um, that, I, I think that's such good information that people I, can use I straight have, away. I have to caveat, obviously. I know people are listening and um, I, I am a psychologist at the end of the day. So this is it's kind of, to some extent, that's my personal experience. I'm not, I'm not a dietitian. Mm-hmm. I, I don't, I don't, do this in my NHS practice. Um, I, I kind of I, I help David with his um, low carb group with the diabetes type two patients, and I kind of do that in my own time. So um, I, I just wanted to kind of make that put clear. that out. Sure, yeah, but th- this is but where and you know um, look for information themselves and experiment, and uh, you know that that's really the. That will really would be my aim that people people try and pursue their own personal health in the way that works best for them and don't necessarily assume that all the things w- that we've been told about what's good to eat for breakfast uh, is right for them. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's exactly what this show is all about. I, I like interviewing people like yourself where for me it's about trying to just so people can listen to the information and they can make up their own mind. It's That for me is informed consent. It's like, okay, so there are options and 
yeah. I, I can decide what I would like to do. So, yeah. or in, and, and especially the research thing and then test yourself yeah. and see if it is. If, if people are on um, medications, certain medications for type 2 diabetes, you know, they would need to do this in association with a health mm-hmm. practitioner because um, it can affect, obviously we've talked about um so sodium and you know so it can affect blood pressure and if you're on medication for that so i, I don't want people just to rush off and tonight in cold off, turkey go cold turkey and then you know, all over Shit. so you know go and get some get some proper advice and uh, get someone to support you as well because that's the other thing that makes a difference isn't it mm-hmm. so that, that actually leads me into a good place where if people want to follow you or find out more about this mm-hmm. now what are some of the links you would suggest yeah, so I'm on Twitter at Jen underscore Unwin. Um, my husband, uh, David Unwin, who, who's a, a GP, is at Low Carb GP, and he's often puts up things about the sugar infographics and other studies and so on. Um, I mentioned, didn't I? Um, Diabetes.co.uk. I have a lot of information for people, and there's a low carb program for type ones, and they've just launched the um, sorry, they've just launched the Type 1 program, so there's a, a, an established program for Type 2 people, but lots of other information, recipes, and so on. And then there's uh, dietdoctor.com that probably people know about, loads of recipes, loads of examples of people who have given up. And there's um, they've got some articles themselves and some videos about sugar addiction that bit, bit Bitter, I think her name is, their, their sugar addiction specialist has put up, so if people want to watch some more videos about sugar addiction, um they can look at those on dartdoctor.com um yeah so those would be the main easy online go-to sources and i'll link to all of those in the show notes yeah fantastic well jen i just want to say thank you so much for sharing your information today and your time um it was really informative and i hope anyone listening to this now understands are they addicted to sugar or not thank you